It's herd mentality, which means you control what gets discussed on the podcast today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Wednesday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day or your first watch if you are joining us on YouTube. If you haven't found us yet, make sure you head on over to YouTube, search Locked On Bills, make sure that you are subscribed and are keeping track of the video content that is coming from this podcast. And very soon we'll start doing some live mock drafts, some live Q&As, and have some more fun on the YouTube channel. Well, it's time for Herd Mentality. We pushed it back one day this week because I wanted to get that discussion with Greg Thompson in yesterday on the podcast. And so we just pushed this one day and we're here. And if you're new, Herd Mentality is the show each week where listeners submit questions, takes, comments, ideas, whatever they have regarding the bills. And I respond to them here on the podcast. And we have some really good stuff to get into today. So let's get started. First one comes from Ted. Ted says, Bills by the Numbers just posted that the Bills ranked number one in pressure percentage. How do you reconcile that with their lack of sack production? So this is a great question. It's a very popular talking point amongst the Bills community. And I think there's some different things that can all be true about this that have led to the Bills being number one in pressure percentage, but also not necessarily having a high volume of sacks. And so there's a lot of things I want to share here. First of all, the Bills' defensive scheme is very much designed to dictate where the quarterback throws the football and funnels throws to specific areas of the field based on down and distance and field positioning. A lot of times, they are inviting throws to come out quick and in spots of the field that are difficult to complete passes and set the Bills up for an opportunity to quickly tackle and get off the field. So that's first of all. Part of it is scheme. Number two is that the Bills are very good, not just very good, the best in the NFL at creating pressure on a snap-by-snap basis, but do not convert enough pressure to sacks. And while we all love sacks, right? Sacks are amazing things. Defensive line is my favorite thing in football. I love watching it love studying it. I love sacks probably more than I do touchdowns. Okay. That's not true, but I love sacks. Let's not forget that pressure also matters. And there's a reason that every single week in previewing the bills upcoming opponent, I give you that quarterback's metrics and splits when they're kept clean versus when they're pressured. And when they're pressured, those numbers are always drastically lower than when they are kept clean. Getting pressure on a quarterback makes that quarterback significantly worse. So when it comes back to reconciling the production here, right? The Bills are really good at creating pressure. They don't get a lot of sacks. I do think the production shows up in other metrics that aren't necessarily sacks. I want to give you some numbers here regarding the Bills' defense. They were number one in the NFL in terms of fewest completions allowed. They gave up 297 completions. The next closest was 314. They had a commanding claim to the number one spot. Number two, they had allowed the fewest touchdown passes in the NFL this past season. They only gave up 12. Next closest was 17. They gave up the fewest passing yards per game, only 163 passing yards per game. Next closest was 187. They allowed the lowest passer rating against their coverage, 65.3. 
The next closest was 73.3. They allowed the fewest adjusted net yards per passing attempt, 3.8. The next closest was 4.5, and that's one of my favorite stats because 3.8 would be a top five rushing defense in the NFL. That's crazy that when opponents pass the football against the Buffalo Bills last year, on average, their net gain of yards was 3.8. And here's another number that I think matters a lot, and it is sack percentage. The Bills were sixth in the NFL last year in sack percentage. That means what percent of drop back passes did the Bills register a sack And they did so 7.3% of the time, which was sixth in the NFL. And so on a per-snap basis, the Bills were not only the best team in the NFL at creating pressure, but they were top six when it comes to percentage of throws against the defense that resulted in a sack. So maybe the Bills' lack of sack production is a bit overstated when you bring up all of those other factors that are tied to not only the pressure rates, but the fact that the Bills were sixth in the NFL in sack percentage. So a lot of information there, but I thought that was an important thing for me to dig into because this is a big narrative about this football team entering the offseason. And when Ted asked me this question, it forced me to really look into it and research it, and I have a different perspective on it. And I hope you do as well. The next one today comes from Andy. Andy says, I remember last year that Sean McDermott mentioned the Bills place a premium on cornerbacks being able to tackle. I was hoping you could tell us who your top five tackling cornerbacks would be in this draft. From TDN Reports, Cam Taylor Britt seems like a good fit. Yeah, you know, Sean McDermott definitely places a premium on cornerbacks that can tackle. And I remember a quote from Ron Rivera one time that stood out to me. And obviously Ron Rivera um, was the head coach for Sean McDermott when he was a defensive coordinator. And so there's obviously a lot of cross-pollination in their defensive uh, philosophies. I remember Ron Rivera said one time that our defense will be as good as our cornerbacks are at tackling. And so tackling in corners is a very important thing for the Buffalo Bills. For some teams, not so much. For the Bills, it's important. So my five best tackling cornerbacks from this draft are Mario Goodrich from Clemson, Andrew Booth Jr. from Clemson, Trent McDuffie from Washington, Sauce Gardner from Cincinnati. I don't think he gets to 25, no way. Uh, Cam Taylor Britt from Nebraska, good call there, Andy and Alante Taylor from Tennessee. Those are the guys, I think I gave you six. There's six of the best tackling corners in this draft. And so if that was a premium trait that the Bills had to have, all of those corners are really, really good at tackling. And from an athletic perspective, I think they're all really good athletes. Maybe Alante Taylor leaves something to be desired, but all these other guys are big, physical, and can run. And so I'd love for the Bills to be able to land one of those corners that I just mentioned. The next one today comes from Tyrone. Tyrone says, on your segment on WGR, first let me stop there. If you didn't know this, I am now weekly on WGR 550 every Wednesday at 8.05 a.m. That started last week, and it will carry through the draft. So um, if you want to hear more of me, You can do so on WGR 550. And so Tyrone is referencing my segment from last week where I said the two main things to focus on this offseason for the Bills, and really this is true for every team, is passing and stopping the pass. Tyrone says, I definitely agree. I'm just a little worried that next season we face a good amount of teams who, who have a strong running game. Starting with our division, we know the Pat style. The Jets have two solid young running backs. Miami could adapt the San Francisco running game with Mike McDaniel coming over and as a way to take pressure off Tua. The teams in the AFC North all have pretty strong running games. Green Bay and Minnesota all have strong running games when they want to use it. 
what are the things that the Bills can do to improve the run defense? We know they need some beef in the middle, but the rest of the defense seems like slimmer, more athletic guys to counter the speed of today's league. Maybe they need to find two bigger run-stuffing players to plug the middle on potential rundowns. Is there anything that they can do scheme-related? It seems like the current scheme of gap discipline is more reactive than proactive, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. It's a great question here, and so let's dig into some of my thoughts. First of all, let's um, let's dig into the Bills and their run defense from last year because it's it's a perceived weakness of this football team. So the Bills last year were 11th in the NFL in yards per carry allowed per rushing attempt at 4.2. So 11th in the NFL, 11th best. They were 14th in the NFL last year in rushing yards per game allowed. And so the Bills are at least an average run defense from last season. They're not like this horrible team against the ground that gets gashed and can't stop anybody. They're they're at least average, maybe slightly above average. But the biggest thing to me in terms of the Bills' run defense improving is not getting gashed by the long runs. That's what killed the Bills. Derrick Henry had that long touchdown run. Damian Harris had a couple of long runs. Leonard Fournette had the big run in the Tampa Bay game. And so I think that's what it comes down to. It's not really a snap-to-snap thing. It's don't get gashed. Don't get parted and give up a 60- or 70-yard rushing touchdown, which they did several times last year. So some other things that need to improve, I think, first of all, Vernon Butler not being on the field ever again for the Buffalo Bills will help their run defense. Bringing back Harrison Phillips would help this run defense. Finding more answers at one tech will help this run defense. And I'll be honest with you, and I'm going to talk more about this next week in depth, I'm not interested in Jordan Davis from Georgia in the first round at all. No way. Again, I'll give you a full explanation on that next week, but there are good run-stuffing one techniques that the Bills can find later in the draft. Travis Jones from Connecticut on day two. John Ridgeway from Arkansas in the third or the fourth round. Noah Ellis from Idaho on day three. So I think getting a player like that to go with Harrison Phillips would be really helpful. But even more important than that, it's the Bills on offense scoring points and forcing other teams to be one-dimensional on offense. That's how the Bills are built. They want to score points, put you in a hole, set the pace and make you chase them and see if you can keep up. It kind of comes back to the Bills' offense doing their thing and making other teams one-dimensional and taking away the run game for them and then, in turn, being able to pin your ears back and create negative plays and turnovers while you're trying to chase the Buffalo Bills' offense. Football might be over for this season, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and and college hoops from all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. And BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC. They've even got Vegas casino games. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends, and the action because bet online is where the game starts. The next one today comes from Norman, and Norman says, Greetings from Melbourne, Australia. After listening to your discussion with Nate Geary, I agree that defensive end and running back are extremely important for this team to be successful and to close the gap with Kansas City and win the Super Bowl. I have two questions. Who would be your top three defensive ends in the first round that will suit our scheme and could have an immediate impact to pair with Gregory Rousseau? Also, what do you think about getting Melvin Gordon in free agency or drafting Brees Hall or Kenneth Walker in the second or third round? Do you have any preference? All right, so we're going to talk a lot of draft very soon on this podcast. And obviously I've been working on this draft class since May of last year. And so I'm, I got a lot of thoughts on these players. 
Um, but to kind of just give you an idea here, as far as first round defensive ends, I mean, these are the guys, Aiden Hutchinson from Michigan, Kayvon Thibodeau from Oregon, David Ajabu from Michigan, Jermaine Johnson, Florida State, Trayvon Walker from Georgia, and George Karloftis from Purdue. I'm not sure that any of them are going to be available for the Bills at pick 25. I think there's a reasonable chance that all six of those players are gone in the top 20. And so if that's true, the value at edge likely won't be there. But if one of those six were to fall and be available at 25, I would like to pick. As far as running back goes, I'm really interested in some of the guys that I think will be available in the late third round or early fourth round. Jerome Ford from Cincinnati, Damian Pierce from Florida, Brian Robbins from, from Alabama. That guy's a monster. I love him. Kevin Harris from South Carolina is a day three guy. Zonovan Knight from NC State's a day three guy. Kevin Harris. Excuse me, I said Kevin Harris already, but those are guys on day three that I really like. So to me, the, the value for defensive end probably won't be there in the first round. And as far as running back goes, I would pair Devin Singletary with one of those mid-round rookies and then sign a veteran like a Deonta Foreman or something along those lines to round out the running back situation. The next one today comes from Mark. Mark says, what round pick is being comfortable trading for a player like Cam Jordan? Now, Cam Jordan's a defensive end for the New Orleans Saints, one of my favorite players in the entire NFL. Now, he's an older guy. He's entering his age 33 season, but he's never missed a game in his career, and I think he's putting together a Hall of Fame caliber resume. I love Cam Jordan. I love to see him on the Buffalo Bills. What would I offer for him? And this might shock you a little bit, but I'd offer a fifth round pick. And maybe you're laughing about that, but that's what the Baltimore Ravens gave up for Calais Campbell when they traded for him two years ago. He was entering his age 34 season when they made that deal. So as far as what I give up, I give up a fifth. The bigger question here is, does the money work? Can the Bills absorb a contract like Cam Jordan? And if you listen to the podcast yesterday with, with Greg Thompson, you know that it's pretty tight. Next one comes from Chris, who says, what is your reply for everyone that wants the Bills to mortgage the future to win now, especially after the Rams were successful? I personally am not a fan of it. Yes, I want Bean to make a logical move when there's opportunity, but I'm opposed to regularly giving up draft picks. I'm open to a Diggs-esque move for a proven defensive end, but I also believe in building through the draft for longevity. I want the Bills to win now, but I also want them to win for years to come. Chris, I'm I'm right there with you all the way on this. And I think about this past season. What could the Bills have done differently this past year to win the Super Bowl? It wasn't scheme. It wasn't talent. The Bills roster was 100% good enough to win the Super Bowl. This team was absolutely good enough. The reason they didn't win the Super Bowl is because they goofed on the last 13 seconds of that game. And I put that squarely on the coaching staff and Sean McDermott. And so this rock, Brandon Bean did his job, right? He did his job. He built a Super Bowl championship caliber roster. And so that's why I don't get overly nervous about the depth chart and the players that are going to be on the field come next season. Brandon Bean has shown us that he can build a Super Bowl championship caliber roster. They just can't goof like they did again when they have the lead with 13 seconds left against the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm with you. I want the, the Bills to keep the window open for as long as possible, but we also have to acknowledge that there is random variance in football, especially in a single elimination tournament to determine the champion. That's just kind of the nature of it. The next one today comes from Doug, 
Thug says, I am of the belief that this team needs to make a digs like trade this time on defense. And Doug mentions Miles Garrett from the Cleveland Browns. What would it take to trade for this beast? And is it actually feasible? Well, Doug, I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't think the Browns would find much interest in trading away Miles Garrett. He's 26 years old. They took him number one overall, and he's one of the best defensive playmakers in the league. Oh, by the way, he just signed a five-year, $125 million extension. So I'm not sure that the Cleveland Browns are very interested in having that conversation. But in terms of parameters, if for some reason they wanted to trade him, I think you have to look at the Khalil Mack trade between the Raiders and the Bears, where the Bears gave up two first-round picks, a three, and a six. I don't think a two first-round picks, a three, and a six gets you, Miles Garrett. I think you have to give up probably at least something else, maybe even a two. Two first, a second, a third, and a six, something like that. It's going to be a ton of money or a ton of capital. And you have to be able to absorb a five-year, $125 million contract, and you have to have the Browns willing to uh, – trade their best player, which I I honestly don't think they will. This is the time of year that I've pretty much given up on all of my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Bilt Bar. It's almost like it's not really a resolution because I enjoy eating them. I got to ask you, have you tried the puffs yet? If you haven't, you are missing out on Bilt Bars or one of Bilt Bars' best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein-infused marshmallow they're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, and they are a treat. They're covered in 100% real chocolate because all Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, puffs included, and these things are healthy for you. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. They have so many great flavors. They have mint brownie, coconut, raspberry, coconut, almond, peanut butter brownie. And new for this month is the white chocolate cookies and cream. And all of these bars are delicious. New flavors are coming out all the time. And at Built Bar, it's all about taste. They make it taste delicious first, then figure out how to make it healthy. And I don't know how, but they pull it off every single time. We got a deal for you. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your next order. Again, that's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. The next one today comes from Will. Will says there have been reports that Christian McCaffrey could be on the trading block. What do you think about the Bills trading a first and some players or later picks for Christian? My take is that the Bills convert him to more of a wide receiver and can use him as a kick returner. He would take the place of Beasley, McKinsey, and RB1B. He could also be the Debo Samuel for this offense. All right, so I like a lot of your ideas there about what to do with McCaffrey. I think the best thing for McCaffrey moving forward is going to be a multifaceted application of his skill set, a lot of slot receiver, some running back, get him going in the return game, all that type of stuff. But as far as the bills go, from a contract absorption, Christian McCaffrey is a completely reasonable player to add. For the Bills or whatever team that would trade for him, they're only on the hook for $8 million in 2022, and that's it. Nothing beyond that. He has no guaranteed money beyond this season if you take on that deal. The problem is that Carolina, regardless if he's on the team or not, they're on the hook for a massive amount of money. And so for them to trade him, they would need to have significant compensation to make it worth their time because he can help the Panthers just like he could help the Bills or other teams. And the Bills aren't going to, or the, excuse me, the Panthers aren't going to commit massive amounts of money to Christian McCaffrey to not be on their team unless they have something very, very worth their time coming in return. And so... When we're talking about trading for Christian McCaffrey, and that including a first-round pick or significant assets that I think Carolina would have to have to do the deal, I personally can't can't get behind it. This guy's barely played over the last two seasons. I mean, I do, like I said, I do love the idea of him transitioning to more of a receiver-running back hybrid. But man, 
I think you're giving up what you would have to give up to get him is just not something I could digest. And it's not even about absorbing the contract. That's perfectly reasonable. It's what moves the needle for Carolina to ship him off and pay him tons of money to not be on their team. Well, kind of, you know, restricting their roster elsewhere. They're going to have to get a lot back in return. I'm not interested in what that's going to be. Eric says, as incredible as Josh Allen has been the past two seasons, it seems that every offseason he talks about working on some element of his game to continue to improve. If you were Jordan Palmer, what element of Josh's game would you choose to work on with him to continue to elevate his game? Well, I have two things written down here. Number one is maintenance. I think for Josh Allen and for him to continue his evolution as a player, it's important for him to maintain the levels that he's gotten to with mechanics and accuracy. And so, first of all, it's about continuing to train that muscle memory to do things a certain way so that he can continue delivering on the field like we've enjoyed over the last two seasons. So that's obviously a big part of the time. Then number two, it's it's more mental stuff. It's how to beat certain coverages. It's protection schemes. It's personnel. It's route combinations. It's that type of stuff. Becoming a student of the game at a higher level. You know what coverages you're going to face. You know what defensive coordinators you're going to have to deal with throughout the course of the season that's coming up and you know the, the defensive coordinators that are always going to be around. And so I would spend a lot of time learning that stuff and obviously maintaining all the great things that have happened over the last couple of seasons. The next one comes from Dan. Dan says, my question for you this week has to do with the wide receiver position for next year, specifically the need for a speedy receiver that can rack up yards after catch. Why isn't Marquez Stevenson considered a legitimate option for the Bills? His college highlights on YouTube are incredible. I know they are just highlights, but it seems he has made plays in a number of different ways in college. I understand he may be limited with a route tree, but you'll have a hard time convincing me that he can't be involved in a screen slant vertical package. He's too fast to be inactive at the very least to let him take the top off the defense on a couple of occasions. Who knows? Maybe Josh can reach him on a deep pass. Lastly, you are excited about Calvin Austin, which in turns makes me excited about him. But can you compare the scouting reports on Marquez Stevenson and Calvin Austin and highlight why drafting Austin over Stevenson makes more sense. All right, I like this question a lot. And um, I guess the good news is I have done full evaluations on both Marquez Stevenson and Calvin Austin. And considering what we didn't see from Stevenson this past year, I think it's really fair to go back to the college scouting report to really have an understanding of his skill set. And so I do trait by trait scouting reports with a summary. And so I'm not going to read the traits, but I do want to read the summary, which I think paints a good picture of both of these players. And hopefully through me delivering this information, we can really contrast these two players and see why um, Calvin Austin is a really intriguing football player in my view and, and what he can add to this offense. So let's go to Marquez Stevenson first. This is what I wrote when I evaluated him coming out of Houston. Houston wide receiver Marquez Stevenson battled injuries early in his career and erratic quarterback play late in his career, but his big ability, excuse me, let me start that over. Houston wide receiver Marquez Stevenson battled injuries early in his career and erratic quarterback play late in his career, but his big play ability was still on full display in college. Stevenson is one of those guys that when you watch him play, he's simply moving at a different speed than everyone else on the field. His speed enables him to win down the field and create after the catch. He has the over-the-shoulder ball tracking skills and field vision to make his speed matter. In addition, Stevenson is a dynamic kick returner that took three of his 38 career kick returns back for touchdowns while averaging more than 26 yards per attempt. When it comes to areas of concern, Missing all but two games in 2016 with a broken collarbone, 
missing all of 2017 with a torn ACL and several games in 2020 with an ankle injury is noteworthy. In addition, he isn't the most physical player and struggles when contact is introduced. Lastly, his speed and scheme often led to production in college, so developing more technique as a route runner will be important for him to reach his potential in the NFL. For a team looking for a big play threat that can stress defenses vertically, horizontally, and in the return game, Stevenson would be a great addition. So now let's contrast that to what I said about Calvin Austin. And kind of the high-level thoughts from Stevenson is tons of injuries. He's got speed. He's got over-the-shoulder ball tracking ability. And a lot of what Houston did in terms of utilization of him and just the way they play offense was able to allow those traits to take over. But there's some rawness to his game in terms of route running and obviously uh, just a, a big jump in terms of what's on your plate as an NFL receiver compared to what was on his plate at Houston. For Calvin Austin, this is what I wrote in my summary of him as a, as a football player in my scouting report. I said, Calvin Austin had a decorated football and track career at Memphis, but don't confuse him as a track guy that plays football. Austin is an outstanding football player that also runs track. Austin is an explosive athlete that can take the top off the defense, but is also lethal with the ball in his hands. His skill set demands touches in the quick game, on handoffs, and in the vertical passing game. Austin isn't just a speedster. He is a nuanced receiver that runs great routes, has terrific hands, and excellent ball skills. He features a diverse release package where he uses foot fire, angles, and twitch to get off the line and into his routes. I love how he controls his speed and maximizes his opportunities to produce after the catch. When it comes to areas of concern, it comes back to his size. Austin is an undersized receiver that doesn't offer much length. The good news for Austin is that he is outstanding at creating separation, but contested catches and the physical components of playing receiver will be a challenge for him. Simply put, Austin is a dynamic playmaker and a big play machine. He has the makings of an electric top three option for an NFL passing game that can also contribute in gadgety ways and as a punt returner. He will make an NFL team more explosive, but there are some limitations to be mindful of because of his frame. And so even when I read that, I just felt in my tone about Calvin Austin, he's just a better player in my view. I think he's a guy that is an NFL ready route runner. He's only five foot seven, 172 pounds, but he's dynamic at beating press coverage. I mean, you are playing with fire if you want to play up on the line of scrimmage against Calvin Austin. He's a proven punt returner, and I just think he's more dynamic with the ball in his hands. He's a, he's a more dynamic football player. He's not as big as Marquez Stevenson, but I just think there's a, a more skilled player in Calvin Austin that doesn't have the same injury concerns that Marquez Stevenson has. So, Dan, I think it's fair to bring up Stevenson as a player that should be considered for this kind of hybrid role of a vertical guy, a yak guy, and a return guy. But when you stack him up against Calvin Austin, you get a lot more excited about what Calvin Austin brings to the table. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. Tomorrow, we will get back on track with our performance review series, talking about the Bills cornerbacks, and then we have the safeties on deck, and then our conversation with Bruce Nolan that I told you would be on Friday. We're pushing that to Monday, and then I'm really excited about everything that's coming next week on the podcast. We're going to get into some really meaty discussion about the offseason and um, really set the stage for our free agency and draft conversations. And so it's all been building to kind of this point, and we got some good stuff to get into here over the next couple of weeks on the podcast. So make sure you don't miss it. Make sure you're subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.